Hey, I'm Ryan. And thanks for checking out our online media library. And I hope this content has been resourcing and equipping you as you journey with Jesus. But I also hope that this isn't the only resourcing and equipping that you're getting in your life. And so if you're not a part of a local church community, I want to invite you to join and go check out a local church community. You know, maybe even come down and check out East Fairview. We'd love to have you. We worship on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. And the thing that we talk about most is living with Jesus together so others may know him. That together part is so important for us. So I want to personally invite you to come down and I can't wait to meet you. And I also lastly just want to thank you again for checking out this content. Be sure to like it, share it, subscribe to it. You may be familiar with the hymn, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, and I want to begin that as an opening prayer. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Wash me just now, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold over my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. This is a wonderful hymn and a prayer. And I associate this hymn with quiet reflection at love feast and at other somber moments. I particularly appreciate the line, mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. Now, that sounds very nice, but then real life intrudes. In real life, we, there are times when we do what we are convinced is God's will, and other people think that we are wrong. Then we have to explain ourselves with words like, that's not what I meant. So let's consider some options where that happened or some stories and situations. I know we don't want to talk about divorce today, but a woman went to her lawyer and said, I want to divorce my husband. On what grounds, he asked. Grounds? We have two acres at the edge of town with a big lawn and some fruit trees. No, that's not what I meant. Do you have a grudge? Yes, we have a two-car garage, but only one car, so we use the rest for storage. Getting exasperated, the lawyer said, does he beat you up? No, I'm up by 6.30, and sometimes he doesn't get up until after I left for work. The lawyer really is exasperated and says, why do you want a divorce? We just can't seem to communicate. <laughs> All right. There are other stories about from the Bible where people say, that's not what I meant. For those of you who are aware of the story of the, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, the Hebrew people. And they came out of Egypt, out of slavery, 
and they tried to enter the promised land, but some of the people said, no, we can't do it. The, the inhabitants are too large for us. It's too scary. We cannot do it. They're giants, and we are like grasshoppers. And so they refused to enter the promised land, and a whole generation died out. And then when the next generation came along, 40 years later, Moses took them to the edge of the, the promised land, and they had to go up the east side of the Jordan River, and they were ready to enter the promised land. And two and a half tribes of the 12 tribes of Israel said, this land east of the Jordan River is ideal for our flocks. We want to inherit that land rather than go west of the Jordan with the other tribes. And Moses threw a fit. Moses was angry. He thought the same thing was happening that happened before. And he accused the two and a half tribes of rebelling against God. He said, and now you, a brood of sinners, has risen in place of your fathers to increase the Lord's fierce anger against Israel. If you turn away from following him, he will again abandon them in the wilderness, and you will destroy all this people. Well, the two and a half tribes were quick to respond, that's not what we meant. We will build sheepfolds here for our flocks, and towns for our little ones, but we will take up arms as a vanguard before the Israelites until we have brought them to their place. And Moses said, oh, okay then. <laughs> well, then a generation or sometime later, Moses dies, Joshua leads the people into the promised land. Those two and a half tribes work with the other nine and a half tribes and they conquer the inhabitants and they're settled. And the two and a half tribes are dismissed by Joshua with Joshua's blessing to go back east of the Jordan and inherit the lands that Moses had agreed they could have. After the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh fulfilled their responsibilities and went back, they settled in this new homeland east of the Jordan. And there they built an altar. And that provoked a crisis. Joshua and the tribes west of the Jordan thought the eastern tribes were violating God's commandment to have one place of worship with one altar in the promised land. That sin was so serious in their eyes that all the western tribes gathered to make war against the eastern tribes. The western tribes said, what is this treachery that you have committed against the God of Israel and turning away today from following the Lord by building yourself an altar today in rebellion against the Lord? The two and a half tribes said, that's not what we meant. It was not rebellion against God. We did it because of our fears that in time to come, your children, west of the Jordan, will say to our children east of the Jordan that you have no part with the Lord, the God of Israel, for the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us. You have nothing to do with us. That would make your children resistant to having our children worship the same God, the Lord. Well, when Phineas heard this, Phineas was the priest, when he heard this, he said, oh, okay then, <laughs> and moved on. There's a story I often use when I did uh, parent-child dedication services. I would talk to the parents ahead of time, and I told this story to help them understand the fallibility of pastors. For years, Hannah wanted to have a baby with her husband, but no child was conceived. On one of her trips to the temple at Shiloh, Hannah prayed, O Lord of hosts, if only you would look on the misery of your servant and remember me, and forget and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli the priest, 
observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. So wise priest that he was, Eli thought that she was drunk. So Eli said to Hannah, how long will you make a spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. And Hannah says, that's not what I meant. You're missing the point. I am a woman deeply troubled. I have, not, I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. And Eli the priest said, oh, okay then, um, may your prayer be granted. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. So even in these Bible stories, you can see that there's a lot of times there's misunderstandings. People trying to do the right thing are misunderstood by others. In any relationship, especially in marriage, there will be times when one or both parties will say, that is not what I meant. Two sincere, faithful people can and will have disagreements. Each of us sees events, hears words, and feels emotions through the filter of our own perspective and experiences. Our opinions and our understanding of the facts may cause us to think that the other person is wrong or sinful or defiant. Many times, if we engage in thoughtful conversation, we will discover that our assumptions or our interpretations were wrong. What we thought about the things we had seen and heard were not what the other person meant. Early in our marriage, Beth and I had to learn how to make decisions together. We each trusted our own judgment. We were both independent thinkers who were confident in the decisions that we made. Therefore, it was somewhat shocking when we disagreed that I was always right and Beth thought her ideas were always right and how were we going to make decisions together. Well, sometimes when we talked it out, we realized that we both wanted the same thing, but we approached it so differently that at first we did not realize that we were actually in agreement. And then it comes to the point, but that's what I was trying to say. And well, no, that's not what you said, but, but we did agree, but we had to talk it out to figure that out. But sometimes disagreements are not because we misunderstand each other, it's because we do understand and don't agree with the decision that the other person wants. Sometimes my decision or my desire is not compatible with the decision that Beth wants to make. Let me give you a hypothetical example. There's a husband who wants to celebrate their wedding anniversary on May 15th with a cruise to the Caribbean. But his wife thinks they ought to go to their grandson's graduation in Kansas on May 15th. One of them is going to have to yield to the other. They cannot do both on the same date in two different parts of the world. They have to figure out a way to work it out. When Paul wrote to the to Christians in the Ephesian church, he was writing to real people in real marriages with real problems. Churches, and marriages have issues to be resolved, problems to be solved, and disagreements to be settled. And here are the guidelines that Paul gave in Ephesians chapter 5. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Paul urges us to love, respect, submit, 
yield and be subject to one another and especially to our spouse out of reverence for Christ. That's the foundation for submission, reverence for Christ. So how do we submit or yield to each other when we strongly disagree? Well, one option is to keep score. You won the last time, it's my turn to win. And you can keep track of that. You know, it's only fair, right, to take turns of who's going to win arguments. That's somewhat complicated at times, but here's a simpler way. You can always do it my way. After all, I'm the oldest one in our marriage. I'm the smartest person in our marriage. I earn the most money in our marriage. And I have the best record for good decisions in our marriage. So it's simpler if we always do it my way, right? Okay. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> as an alternative to those methods and others you may think of, I want to suggest four principles for submitting to one another in disagreements. The first is to speak honestly. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul wrote, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Do you catch that? It's speaking the truth in love. So we don't lie in love, and we don't speak the truth with hatred. It's speaking the truth with love. When we speak to our spouse, we must be careful not to exaggerate, mislead, or deceive. If we are dishonest, it is clear that we are not acting out of reverence for Christ. It is clear that we are not submitting to the other if we are trying to manipulate them by lying to them. It's much more helpful to say things like, this is what I think and this is what I feel, to simply state the truth honestly. Now, one, I'm going to make a confession here. One of the challenges that I had early in our marriage, we, it's not helpful if we try to anticipate what the other person will say or think or do. For example, if I want to go to McDonald's for a Big Mac, but I suspect that Beth really wants to go to a sit-down restaurant, a, a sit-down Mexican restaurant. It is not helpful or even honest for me to say, I would like to eat Mexican tonight. It's more honest and helpful to say, I'm in the mood for a burger. What are you in the mood for? And then consider options together. I got in a lot of trouble when I tried to anticipate what Beth wanted, and I tried to agree with her. I love her, after all, so I tried to anticipate what she wanted, even if that is not what I wanted. But sometimes, that's not what she wanted either. I was wrong. And so, <laughs> my deceit, saying this is what I wanted to do when it really wasn't what I wanted to do, contributed to misunderstanding and friction, rather than... Uh, being honest would have been much more helpful. All right, another example. If you are talking about a major purchase, be honest about what you think and feel. Tell your spouse if you think you cannot afford it or if the time is not right or you don't like that product at all. Do not agree to the purchase if you have strong reservation against it. Here's a suggestion that I have found helpful. Say something like this. This is what I think and believe now. What do you think and believe? I may change my mind if I hear your views. Now, the problem with that is many times I do not want to hear the opinion of another person, especially Beth, there are times when I do not want to change my mind. I have already decided. It's done. It's a done deal. 
Don't confuse me with the facts. Have you ever heard that? I don't want to know the facts. I want to do it my way. And that's not honest. That, that's not helpful in a marriage. But when we openly, honestly talk about our perspectives, our ideas, our feelings, we can figure out a way forward together. That leads us to our next principle. Listen carefully. One of the advantages of marriage is that God has given us the wisdom and experience of someone we love to help us make good decisions. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 to 12, there's this passage. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up the other. But woe to one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though one might prevail against another, two will withstand one. A three-fold cord is not quickly broken. We need the wisdom and experience of our spouse to make good, wise decisions. To refuse to listen, to ignore or reject a spouse's opinions and ideas is reckless and irresponsible. God put us together in marriage to make each of us better people, the people God created us to be. So listen carefully so that you clarify the facts and the issues in any disagreement. If I'm opposed to a purchase because I think that it costs $200, and Beth points out to me that the actual price is $100, I may change my mind. I may say, well, that's a lot cheaper than I expected. Sure, that's okay. Let's get that product. Or sometimes I need to think, what are the issues when Beth says she does not want to spend the holiday with my family? Does Beth suddenly not like my family? Does she not want to travel that far? Does she think the visit will cost too much? Or... Does she want to surprise me with a romantic overnight stay in a resort on that date? Now, I won't know the answers unless I listen to what she has to say. We need to listen carefully. The third principle is to pray sincerely. Pray for discernment to know what is God's will. Pray together and separately for a clear understanding of God, what God wants you to do. In a 2017 article, Tom Wagner differentiated three ways of responding to disagreements in our congregations, which also applies to disagreements in marriages. There is debate, dialogue, and discernment. He writes, debate is competitive by nature. There is a winner and a loser. Debate is useful in reducing a list of options to a final decision. We can learn a lot by setting facts and ideas against each other. So when you husbands and wives talk with each other, are you having a debate? Are you trying to convince the other of what you need to do? Tom Wagner continues, dialogue is another way to communicate. In dialogue, we share information to build understanding rather than to persuade. Participants live in some level of mutual acceptance, but not necessarily agreement. While dialogue can be a part of a good decision-making process, it may not be the final step. The third way is discernment. In discernment, faith communities come together to see God's will. Discernment moves us beyond majority rule and compromise to consensus. God's love is reflected as much in the process as in the outcome. Discernment is a patient and prayerful process, not hasty, but more enduring. 
in marriage, pray for discernment that you can figure it out together. Don't pray, as many of us want to do, that my wife will see the wisdom of my choice, that my wife will agree with me. God, open her eyes so she sees it my way. I mean, those are prayers, but they're not appropriate prayers. Pray rather for discernment so that together you would understand and do God's will. Pray also that you will have enough self-awareness to identify your feelings in your relationship with your spouse. In the midst of conversation, what am I feeling now? And often it's, why am I so upset over this? Why, Why does this bother me so much? For instance, Am I jealous because Beth is smarter and more organized than I am? Or is it my pride is hurt because Beth's ideas made more sense than mine? Confession. I am thankful every day that I married a smart woman, but there are challenges for me as I have to adjust my thinking and have to change my mind at times because she is right. That's, that's hard. All right. Sometimes I have to evaluate, be self-aware. Am I angry with Beth simply because she does not agree with me? Or am I angry with myself because I know that I was being wrong or petty or irresponsible and she's simply holding up the mirror to what I've done or what I've said? Being self-aware is very important. And a classic example of someone who is not self-aware is the person who gets red in the face, clenches his fist, and screams, I am not angry. (laughs) You ever hear that? I, I am not angry. And you can see it is so very evident. But the person is not praying for self-awareness. The person wants to be proven right. We want to get our own way. It's nothing new. Even in the time that Paul wrote to the Ephesians, this same principle is at work. Paul wrote, be angry, recognize your emotions, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's advice that Paul was giving to a church, and it's certainly appropriate for our marriages. Then the last principle is love wholeheartedly. Why did you get married? There may be a lot of different reasons, but consider that I hope, at least, one of the reasons is if not the most important reason, is that you love each other, that you love the person you married. You saw in that other person enough beauty of character that you committed yourself to love that person for the rest of your life. On the day of your wedding, you made a promise something like this. I take you to be my husband or wife. I promise before God and these witnesses to be your loving and faithful wife or husband in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, for as long as we both shall live. We made a commitment to that other person to love and care for that person. Paul wrote about the kindness of love in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. In the midst of a disagreement, our commitment to love our spouse and to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ limits what we can say or do. Ask yourself, 
Or if you are really brave, ask your spouse or your children how well you are living up to this standard. Ask them, am I patient with you? Am I kind? Am I envious? Am I boastful or arrogant? Um, it's not arrogant to say I'm always right when that's the truth, right? And no, no brag, just fact. Okay. Sorry, I heard that line 70 years ago or so. And, okay, am I rude? Do I insist on my own way? Do I insist on my own way? Am I irritable? Am I resentful? Or am I playing the martyr without love? All right, whatever you say, dear, I'll go along. Paul wrote about that too. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Paul wrote about the humility of love in the second chapter of Philippians. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who Though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. James wrote about the wisdom of love in James chapter 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy." In every interaction with your spouse, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Make a commitment to treat your spouse with kindness, respect, and love, even when you disagree. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we are thankful to you for the scriptures that guide us. We're thankful to you for your son, Jesus, who saves us and who gave us an example of yielding completely to your will, to submitting himself to you and showing us how to submit to one another out of love. Guide us in our family relationships, the relationship between husband and wife, the relationship between children and parents, in the relationships that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us at all times to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Amen. Amen.